Hello there, this is Mark Smith with Family Tree Counseling Associates. I'm going to be speaking on the subject PTSD, misunderstood, undiagnosed, and mistreated. We're living in a culture where the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is under evolution. For many years, it was seen as something that Vietnam veterans suffered from or Desert Storm veterans. What we know now is that post-traumatic stress disorder is something that anybody can suffer from. Anybody can have panic attacks over a whole variety of different traumatic experiences. And we need to open up our vision as to people's experiences and really understand what's going on with them. In our medical community, if somebody starts to act a little crazy, then we, we tag them with some of our most crazy diagnoses where when you have a post-traumatic stress disorder reaction and behavior you're, you're going to act a little bit crazy but it's not crazy given the trigger given your vulnerability given the intensity in your body the wound that you have it's not crazy it makes sense it just looks sort of crazy in my experience, after April 26th of 2015, I, I was acting crazy. I had massive panic attacks, frequent, intense, and I was told by my former fiance, she thought that I was crazy and her treatment center thought I was crazy and I certainly was acting crazy. But given, given the circumstances and the wounding and the trauma and the panic attacks, uh, it made all the sense in the world. And um, what would have been helpful uh, for me and for many people who get these diagnoses is empathy, understanding. I worked with a couple recently where he had some really intense panic reaction and was labeled with a crazy making incorrect psychiatric label and it was such a relief to him to find out hey if <clears throat> if your pain came up in the middle of a shattering psychologically that was going on in your life that is not this psychiatric disorder that they're trying to tag you with. It just isn't. It's post-traumatic stress disorder. So <clears throat> I think in our culture there is a, 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 a lot of shame still about, for instance, the psychiatric label of bipolar. I was watching a movie uh, it was called The Intern with uh, Robert De Niro uh, was in it, Anne Hathaway. And there was actually a joke in the movie, and the butt end of the joke was uh, somebody who had bipolar disorder. Um, so there, there's, there's a tangible, measurable, um, you know, if you take medication, if you have bipolar, you're crazy. And many times... It's an incorrect diagnosis. In our culture, you know, we're, we're always looking for the boogeyman. We're, we're looking for the bad guy. You know, who's the bad guy and how can we, you know, uh, protect ourselves uh, from the bad guy? Um, we we want to give people labels. Anytime a spouse contacts me and, and has a label that they've come up with from the internet for their spouse, I'm very skeptical. You know, uh, a woman contacts me. This happens 50 times a year. I think my, my husband 
is a narcissist or a, a, a man contacts me I think my wife has borderline personality disorder I think my husband is a sociopath I think my boyfriend is a psychopath um, or they're given if they are tearful and they cry a lot they're given the uh, diagnosis of major depression so I wanted to go over some of the symptoms of PTSD this is taken from the website of the Mayo Clinic and it's sort of sprinkled in with some of my experience but this is what PTSD looks like it can look like major depression it can look like bipolar it can look even like narcissism but you can't help somebody unless you really understand what it is they're suffering with and I'm uh, my one of my missions now in life is is to lessen the shame that people feel from being given a diagnosis that isn't correct okay so Let's start this with the Mayo Clinic's uh, first point, and that is there, there's in, uh, intrusive memories. Uh, so number one, recurrent, unwanted, distressing memories of a traumatic event. Number two, reliving the traumatic event as if it were happening again, or flashbacks. And that's, that's the horrible thing about PTSD is something will wound you but then something will come along and trigger a memory and you're right back in the soup um, this happens very frequently with affair related issues you pass a restaurant that you know your husband took his lover to or a hotel or a city you, you hear the name Houston or Atlanta and you, you, you conjure up that person or you hear a name. Here's a common one and that is your former lover's vehicle. You know, whatever they drive, it feels like every second vehicle is that car. They're everywhere the same color and you're looking at them to see if it's them. Upsetting dreams about the traumatic event um, when I was at the treatment center this summer there was a fellow there who had PTSD and when he was awake he, he uh, seemed like a pretty nice fellow but he was uh, my roommate but he was like on the other side of the room and there was a little dividing space and I, I was there first night with major PTSD symptoms and um, uh, he started to yell and cuss and drop f-bombs in his sleep and really loud so he, he was having dreams about his traumatic event and uh, scared <laughs> scared a guy who was a little jumpy to begin with but if you're having dreams that's not a bad sign that that is actually a good sign that is something that will it's, it's just your your mind uh, doing therapy um, as you're sleeping and that's that's not a bad thing that's that's actually a, a good thing and it's it means your your mind is working on your healing severe emotional distress and physical reaction to something that reminds you of the event um, one of my triggers, and I won't go into it, was a red truck. Every time I saw a red truck, my heart would beat fast, my uh, I'd lose my breath, I'd get all sweaty and clammy. It would feel like I just got punched in the stomach. My stomach would get queasy. Um, my hands would shake. Every time I saw a red truck. That's PTSD. The second thing uh, category is avoidance. Trying to avoid thinking or talking about the traumatic event. 
Number two, avoiding places, activities, and people that remind you of the traumatic event. So, um, yeah, there are there are restaurants that I know my uh, former fiance went to with the man she was acting out with, and I don't go in those restaurants. Some of them I'm, I'll never go into. I know that. I just don't want to take the risk of being re-triggered. Um, I try not to be too rigid about that. If one of the restaurants was McDonald's, and if I'm on the road and that's all there is, I'll stop and eat at McDonald's. But if I have a choice, uh, I'd prefer not to re-traumatize myself. Another thing that gets avoided is uh, food. I you know, many times you'll be talking with people who had PTSD and, and you'll say, well, how much weight did you lose? How much weight did you lose? Um, and you're not even trying to lose weight. You're just not interested in food. I lost uh, 53 pounds. Negative changes in your thinking and your mood. So number one, negative feelings about yourself and other people. So you're going to have shame and and you're you're going you're so wounded you're going to see yourself as being pretty unlovable and you're going to have difficulty trusting people right after i found out about all the infidelity i was in a cvs and there were must have been 20 women in the store and every one of them i would look at and i would go i bet she's cheating on her husband with her boss at work you know, or I looked at somebody else and said, you know, I bet she's a drug addict. I mean, I just, I was projecting onto other people the negative feelings related to my shattering. Inability to experience positive emotions, feeling emotionally numb. I, I take issue with this one. This is from the Mayo Clinic. I never felt numb. I, I wish that I did. Perhaps, perhaps some folks who were shattered had the relief of numbness, but I, I did not. Lack of interest in activities you once enjoyed, that's for sure. Hopelessness about the future. Memory problems, including not remembering important aspects of the traumatic event. Um, the first week or two of after the trauma happened, I did things and then I've since uh, heard stories of, of stuff I did, just, I mean, not huge things, but, and I'm like, I didn't do that. And they're going, yeah, yeah, you did. I'm like, really? Um, tearfulness. This is one I added to the list. Um, you're going to cry at the drop of a hat. Um, I went to a funeral yesterday um, of, a, of a distant relative, and... Um, couldn't stop crying. Um, you know, there were people there from the past that loved me and I loved them. And it was a tearful experience just because I'm tearful in general. My daughter came up to me and said, are you, are you crying about her? The lady who passed away. And I said, no, I'm just crying. And then the last thing is difficulty maintaining close relationships because, uh, Peter Levine says there's a tiger in the room. Well, you expect a, a man-eating vicious tiger to jump out of that other person, that new person, or even if it's a friend at any moment. You're not safe because it feels like there's a tiger in the room. Changes in emotional reactions and that's uh, becoming irritable, angry outbursts, aggressive behavior. I'd shared before that I, I underestimated the impact of being traumatized with this horrible information. And I, I, I decided to go on a cruise with my daughter. And there was a lot of irritability and, and angry outbursts and aggressive behavior. It wasn't directed at her, but it, it, was, it was about another point, and that is that you might experience claustrophobia. So I would feel claustrophobic, and I might 
I might uh, say aggressive things under my breath and then my, my daughter would hear it. Uh, always being on guard for danger, hyper alert. Uh, I'd mention overwhelming guilt and shame, self-destructive behavior such as drinking too much or driving too fast. Mine wasn't so much, I guess it was driving too fast, um, but I really wasn't a safe driver or early on with the PS, PTSD stuff, and, and you probably won't be either. If, if you have experienced a major trauma, whether it's finding out your spouse has been having an affair, or you find out that you were sexually abused as a child, or you, you've been attacked and mugged or raped, or anything like this, or the death of a child, anything that traumatizes you, uh, you need to not work, you need to, um, get treatment for your PTSD stuff. And I was out driving around. I, I had several near accidents. I accidentally ripped the mirror off my Thunderbird. I got a speeding ticket uh, near Holland, Michigan. And I was so, I was after a long therapy session and I was exhausted and I, I broke down, started crying when the guy pulled me over because I was just so overwhelmed. And ended up needed to take an online uh, driver safety course to redeem myself. So thank goodness there is redemption. Trouble concentrating, trouble sleeping. I've never worked with anybody or known of anybody who didn't have trouble sleeping after uh, being traumatized. Psychomotor agitation. This is one that I added for the first two or three months after I was traumatized, I couldn't sit in a chair and I would just pace back and forth. Sort of like a tiger would pace. And then I read the, the book about, you know, trauma is like a tiger's in the room. So I related to the tiger. Sensitivity to loud noises. Uh, somebody, even six months later, I can't really have the radio on loud. It just makes me uh, really uncomfortable, and it triggers panic attacks. And then, uh, of course, suicidal ideation. You're, you're going to probably be in so much pain, at least the thought of suicide will come across your mind. So, it's important to know what you have. And if you have PTSD, then you're not going to get it treated by taking medication for major depression or medication for bipolar disorder. I want to recommend my 70-minute video. There's a link on this video for it because I talk about how do you treat trauma? How do you treat PTSD? So it's not mainly treated with medication, it's treated with yoga and meditation and eye movement desensitization, desensitization, blah, you know what I'm saying, and reprocess and EMDR, <laughs> exercise, body work, go to a place like on-site, a treatment center in near Nashville and do psychodrama. Um, jump in the hot tub, that'll help you. Uh, read a book like Dr. Bessel van der Kock's book, The Body Keeps Score. Learn more about abandonment by reading The Journey from Abandonment to Healing by Susan Anderson and also downloading my book on abandonment issues, Managing abandonment issues through recovery and you can get that on our website and also get it on uh, amazon.com you treat ptsd by feeling your feelings unfreezing your feelings and crying and crying and getting in touch with your anger and using a tennis racket to hit the couch or hit a punching bag to release that anger that you've been carrying around in your body your whole life. The main thing, several main things, is 
do not think like a victim. It's easy when you've experienced trauma to blame a former spouse or blame your spouse or, or blame a former girlfriend or whatever. But <clears throat> the truth is that we, we always pick and invite the right person into our life. And, and if you were severely abandoned or abused as a child, you're, you're going to reenact that. And I, and I wish it wasn't true, but, but it's true. And it's just a plot by the universe to really push you to do your work. And if, if your partner isn't able to do the work and your relationship ends, it's still redemptive and it's still positive because now you have an opportunity to get healthier than you've ever been. So you're not a victim. You're a choice maker. You're an overcomer. You're a survivor. And you have a bright future ahead of you. And you need to work on loving you better than you've ever been loved in your whole life. And the last thing I want to touch on is just the acronym HALT. It's really important. It stands for uh, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. So you, you want to arrange your life where you're not walking around low blood sugar. Because if you're suffering from PTSD, you have this condition that doesn't do well when you're having low blood sugar. You can't walk around seething with bitterness and anger. Oh my goodness. You're going to just be in a rage and you're going to be somebody who just alienates the people in your life. And you can't, you can't isolate yourself where you're too lonely. You need to reach out to people, even if it's just texting them. You know, constantly keep a flow of support and connection. Now, having said that, um, also learn to embrace being alone, but not being lonely. You can be alone with ne without necessarily being lonely. I came home from the funeral yesterday, and I was, I was halt. I, I was uh, lonely and tired. And so I knew the key to the rest of my day and the key to my weekend was getting in bed and getting a long nap. And I did just that. And I did reach out to some friends and get some support. So don't be too lonely and definitely don't walk around exhausted because you're, you're going to be exhausted anyway. One of the symptoms I didn't mention of PTSD is just bone weary, overwhelming, almost debilitating fatigue. So download the video. It, it, it's going to cost you $7.95. And if you have PTSD and you've been misdiagnosed as having something else, then it'll be the best $7.95 you ever spent. So hit the link. It'll take you to information. It'll take you to the book. You'll be glad that you did. Join our YouTube channel, Family Tree Counseling, on youtube.com. And visit our website. There's not only one book on abandonment, but there's a book on shame. There's a book on affair recovery. There's a book on counterdependency. There's lots of good stuff. It's a beautiful Sunday. I'm going to go have breakfast with my kids. God bless, and thank you for watching.